Well, today I'd like to speak about one of the most significant bridges built in the U.S. in the 19th century. Uh, it was the bridge built by the Western Railroad over the Connecticut River at Springfield, Massachusetts, between 1840 and 1841. The Western Railroad was a daring venture to recapture the commercial re relevance of Massachusetts, particularly the city of Boston. Uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, four U.S. East Coast cities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, were really competing to expand their commercial interests to the West. The West meant either access to Lake Erie in the Great Lakes region or to the Ohio River. The Ohio River was the first uh, or the nearest river that flowed west from Pittsburgh. Both the Cumberland River and the Tennessee River flowed into the Ohio. Therefore, the Ohio River was the water transportation route to much of North America. New York was the first to achieve this goal. The Hudson uh, River, you can see going north from New York to Albany, uh, was navigable up to Albany, and New York completed the uh, Erie Canal, which co connected Buffalo to Albany. Therefore, uh, from 1824 on, New York City boomed. They really enjoyed a water transportation monopoly for over uh, 15 years. To compete, the, in 1828, Maryland chartered the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad with the goal of building a railroad from Baltimore to the Ohio River. Pennsylvania decided on building a canal system from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh on the Ohio. But both of these efforts really faced a formidable obstacle of a spine of mountains extending from Western Maryland and Virginia through Pennsylvania. Having no high-level water supplies, the canal through Pennsylvania actually had to portage canal boats on inclines over the mountainous terrain. Massachusetts and Boston understood that they would be excluded from much of this Western commerce unless they established a rail connection to Albany. By 1833, a railroad from Boston to Worcester had been completed. What was needed was a railroad extending from Worcester to the Massachusetts-New York border and from where a short line could connect it with Albany. Therefore, the state of Massachusetts chartered the Western Railroad in 1833 from Worcester to West Stockbridge. Uh, by 1836, financing was secured for the railroad, and it began to seek out qualified and experienced engineers to design and build the railroad. There were two major challenges. One was that, that the lowest pass through the Berkshires was was at an elevation of 1,470 feet. The grade required from the town of Chester to the summit was an unprecedented for a railroad. No railroad had previously been attempted over such mountainous terrain. This challenge was ultimately met by a unique set of stone arches, retaining walls, and buttresses following the course of the Westfield River. The successful completion of these features was a great engineering and construction achievement. But today I'll speak about the second principal challenge, the crossing of the Connecticut River, which was approximately 1,300 feet wide at Springfield. Successful completion of a bridge really requires both engineering science, which is based on theory, and practical design and construction experience. The genealogy, so to speak, that enabled the successful completion of the CRV is important for engineering history. It may be explained as follows. The engineering science really originated with a French savant uh, called Claude Navier. He was a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique, the preeminent engineering school of the time, who published his lectures in 1826. This book was transformative for engineering because it proposed and defined engineering design based on mathematical models for structures and an understanding of the strength of materials and members. The book contained many seminal contributions. At this time, American engineering education really followed the French model. Study of French was required at West Point and other colleges that offered technical education. Navier's engineering science was very likely transferred to the US through West Point, therefore, but also certainly by the engineer Stephen Harriman Long, who was a 1909 graduate of Dartmouth College. Long's writings cite the work of Navier and for other French authors. Long was commissioned into the elite Corps of Engineers and led several expeditions to the American West. The West Point cadet William H. Swift 
was a member of one of his expeditions. In 1828, Long was appointed head of the Board of Engineers of the B&O Railroad. On the board with him were two other West Point graduates, George Washington Whistler and William G. McNeil, and the civil engineer, Jonathan Knight. In 1828 and 1829, McNeil, Whistler, and Knight traveled to Britain to study the design of British railroads, transferring some of the British technology to the design of the B&O. Regrettably, the B&O Board of Directors decided to disband the Board of Engineers in 1830 because of a conflict regarding whether the engineers or the contractors had the final authority on the design or the construction of the railroad, specifically regarding the types of bridges that should be built. Therefore, from 1830 to 1836, McNeil, Whistler, and Swift received appointments from several other Middle Atlantic and New England railroads as chief engineers or resident engineers. In 1836, the Western Railroad hired McNeil, Whistler and Swift, McNeil and Whistler were hired as co-chief engineers, Swift was hired as a resident engineer. Because of his superior performance, by 1839, Whistler became the sole chief engineer. Therefore, the Western Railroad was led by three of the most able and experienced railroad engineers in the United States. However, the Connecticut River Bridge incorporated innovations that did not originate with these engineers, but rather from two builders, William Howe and Amasa Stone, who were awarded the contract to build the Connecticut River Bridge in 1839. A brief explanation of the engineering science developed by Navier is really important for understanding and appreciation of the Connecticut River Bridge. In this context, Navier's contribution was his understanding and analysis of what, are, what he called trust beams. This is Navier's figure 94. Uh, it illustrates a structure that he understood or modeled as a trust beam. It has a, the horizontal member is called the top cord, the bottom horizontal member is called a bottom cord. Um, his observation was this that if the framing, if the diagonals and the verticals within the cords could maintain plane sections plane, then the flexural capacity of the uh, truss beam may be expressed by a simple formula, which he derived. The formula is equal, is shown, it's equal to, the capacity is equal to the allowable stress times the width of the uh, top cord and bottom cords times the distance squared between them. Long studied this formula and understood it and sought to apply it to the practical design of truss bridges for the B&O Railroad. Long's contributions were many, including the, the first railroad manual written in the United States in 1829. In the 1829 manual, he also included a description of a wood truss design uh, for the B&O, which was to be used for the Carrollton Viaduct. Long received a patent for his trust in March 6 of 1830. He also wrote brick booklets uh, for in 1830, 1836, and 1841. In these booklets, he really uh, defined rational design for these trusses. He had a set of tables for member sizes for various spans varying from 60 feet to 300 feet. These tables were based on Navier's analogy of a truss as a frame beam. He also specified a design load of 120 pounds per square foot. And this was equivalent to the design of two uh, trains uh, on, the, uh, on a bridge concurrently. He, he prescribed a truss depth of about one-tenth of the span of the bridge. And he also prescribed braces from the piers to the lower cord. Long marketed his uh, design through agents who demonstrated uh, his uh, design by uh, use of physical models. This is an image of a model of Long's bridge design now held by the Hopkinton Historical Society at Hopkinton, New Hampshire, where Stephen Harriman Long was born. As is evident, it is basically the truss illustrated by Navier. However, Long's design had an important innovation. 
The diagonal members in such a truss can either be in tension or compression. However, it is very difficult to design and detail a tension connections in wood, especially at this time period. Therefore, Long pre-compressed the diagonals by driving wedges, as illustrated by this drawing from the historic American engineering record. Therefore, Long precluded the need to design tension connections for the diagonals and made both diagonals active for carrying load and providing stiffness. This pre-compression in the diagonals, which is shown in red on the model, uh, caused a pre-tension in the vertical members shown in blue. Although there's no written evidence, it's a practical certainty that Long explained Navier's engineering science as the basis of his published tables and details of his trust design to his protégés, Whistler, McNeil, Swift, and J.M. Fessenden. Incidentally, Whistler, upon graduation from West Point, eloped with uh, William Swift's young sister, Mary, who bore three children with Whistler, but unfortunately died as a young woman. After four years as a, as a widower, Whistler married William G. McNeil's sister, Anna McNeil. So Whistler was a brother-in-law to both Swift and McNeil. It's logical that these protégés of Long would use only his Long's, their mentor Long's design for the bridges. In fact, J.M. Fessenden used Long's design uh, for the Boston and R Lowell Railroad bridges. And Whistler, McNeil, and Swift also used their mentor's design. All except one of the Western Railroad truss bridges east of the Connecticut River used Long trusses. The one exception is, uh, was not, did not originate with the engineers, but with two builders from towns on the Western Railroad. And they were William Howe and Amasa Stone. They were also brothers-in-law. Uh, William Howe married Amasa Stone's sister, Azuba. But they worked together as contractors, particularly with heavy timber framing. They knew that building railroad bridges would be very lucrative for the foreseeable future and sought to participate in the boom. No doubt familiar with Long's trusts, and may actually have, been, have built some, uh, but importantly, Howe must have keenly observed its weaknesses. Howe conceived key improvements, and he con convinced Whistler to allow them to build one bridge for the Western Railroad at Warren, Massachusetts, that apparently included his innovations. This is an image of Howe and Stone's bridge at Warren, Massachusetts, from a book by Richard Sanders Allen, the pioneering U.S. historian of uh, covered wooden bridges. It is thought to be the first Howe truss, probably built in 1839, but details of its framing have really not been found. Howe's innovations are shown in his patent drawing from 1840. He substituted threaded wrought iron rods for the vertical members, and he pre-stressed the truss by tightening the nuts on these threaded rods rather than by driving wedges. He also designed node blocks keyed into the cords as bearings for the diagonals. Whistler was clearly convinced of the merits of Howe's innovations, and he awarded a prize contract for the construction of the Connecticut River Bridge to William Howe and Amasa Stone. Amasa Stone was only 22 years old. Therefore, the design of the, and construction of the Western Railroad's Connecticut River Bridge had the following genealogy. It included the engineering science of Navier as interpreted by Long. It included Long's conceptual design guidelines and his pre-stressing concept. It included Howe's innovations, including the introduction of wrought iron rods and it included Whistler's detailed design and Howe and Stone's fabrication and construction expertise. The design that emerged was this. There were seven spans, each of 180 feet. The bridge was founded on piles with granite piers. It was designed for a single track only. Its depth was 18 feet one-tenth of the span as advocated by Long. There were braces from the piers to the lower cord, 
and the, if you look at the cross section of the bridge, it had lateral or horizontal bracing on the planes of the top and bottom cord. The panels or the distances between the iron verticals were seven feet. The diagonal members spanned two panels. And if you look at the cross section over the pier, uh, it had floor beams that were rested directly on top of the bottom cord. But what was most important about this bridge were the all important details. The, the bridge had each vertical consisted of two two inch diameter wrought iron bars, threaded at one end and headed at the other end. It had oak bearing blocks keyed or indented into the cords. The diagonals had simple square ends which were not positively connected to the bearing blocks, but placed in compression by tightening the nuts on the iron bars. The top cord consisted of three eight by eight wood sticks. The bottom cord consisted of four five inch by 12 inch and two four inch by 12 inch sticks. These six bottom cord sections were bound together by through bolts at two feet on center without scarf or fish plate connections along their lengths. It's important to understand that these details were radically different from practically all previous wooden bridges. These details used no traditional heavy timber joinery, what are called sometimes scarf joints or fish plate joints, mortise and tenon joints, or wood dowels or tree nails. It had no supplementary wooden arches, such as in Burna Burr bridges. It had simple square ends on all the members. All its members were a uniform size along the span. It was optimized for ease of fabrication and erection. But the most important facet is that erection of the bridge did not require master timber framers for erection. These details allowed a fabrication and erection process that was completely different from previous practice. The fabrication and erection process is explained in an 1843 book by John Wheel, and the, and the process was really explained to John Wheel by uh, George Washington Whistler himself. Let me read this to you. The several frames for each opening must be accurately fitted and put together in a carpenter's yard. When the piers and abutments have been carried up to the proper height to receive the false work platform, the frames are then taken to pieces and re-erected in their permanent position. That is, the Connecticut River Bridge was completely prefabricated. It was pre-assembled, disassembled, and then reassembled in place without the need for master timber framers. It's estimated that one prefabricated span could easily be erected in two days. Timber bridges, of course, require protection from the weather. And for railroad bridges, also protection from the fire hazard from cinders ejected by the steam engines. Whistler's design then included the following weather protection and fire protection features. The truss frames are covered in and whitewashed. What did that mean? He did not put a roof over the rails, but rather each individual truss was boxed in with siding on both sides of the truss. And then he whitewashed the siding with no roof again over the rails. He covered the entire floor below the rails with tin panels. The Connecticut River Bridge had interesting architectural features also. In the 1820s, the French published their monumental description of Egypt, which documented observations made by French savants during Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. The volumes on Egyptian architecture captivated Europe and America and led to the use of Egyptian architectural details, including in design by prominent engineers such as Navier. Navier designed his famous suspension bridge uh, in Paris, Les Invalides, in 1823, and it had Egyptian motifs for the columns. Whistler also chose to use Egyptian architectural details of the, on the Western Railroad. This was the Springfield por portal, as illustrated in Carl Gega's 1845 book. 
Of course, this portal is not executed in stone, but rather in wood. But it has several features of Egyptian architecture. It has the cavetal cornices. It has the battered or inclined walls. It has the winged sun orb. Whistler was a talented delineator and an amateur artist, so he must have just been infatuated with Egyptian architecture. But one can just imagine a person from a Massachusetts village on his, on his or her first train ride seeing this portal which evoked Egyptian timelessness, permanence, and security. That person would not have had time to consider that he or she was crossing on a new type of bridge, experimental, using a new, still developing mode of transportation. The portal is really reminiscent of the main gate to Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was built in 1831. Uh, it, this gate might possibly have been known by Whistler. Whistler also used Egyptian architectural features on other Western Railroad facilities. This is the, these are the Springfield, Massachusetts, and Chester, Massachusetts stations. If you note, they also have Egyptian-style columns, cavetto cornices, and battered walls. Incidentally, uh, for the town of Chester, he, he put this imposing dark monolith in the middle, uh, but certainly it was a disguised water tank for supplying the steam engines. The only image of the Connecticut River Bridge that is known to me is this woodcut that appears in an 1847 book by Guild. If you note that the vertical scale of the portal relative to the locomotive seems really exaggerated, but the sketch clearly shows that Whistler defined the spans with Egyptian-style pilasters at the piers. The successful completion of the Connecticut River Bridge on July 4, 1841, had immediate significant consequences for the Western Railroad and for bridge design, both in the United States and internationally. Long's Trust was immediately abandoned by the Western Railroad in a frenzy of construction of how bridges occurred. All the bridges west of Springfield used how trusses. Approximately 40 bridges with a combined length of about 3,900 feet were built in less than two years. Many of these bridges were no doubt built by a mass of stone. The fact that how bridges could be prefabricated and erected without master timber framers led to the industrialized fabrication of bridges by newly formed bridge companies. The driven amass of stone wasted no time in this process. With a partner, Azariah Booty, he purchased his brother-in-law's patent rights in 1842 and formed perhaps the first company dedicated to the shop fabrication of bridges. And then he formed additional partnerships uh, with uh, Daniel L. Harris and as well as Azariah Booty. Stone's biographer, Joblin, wrote in... 1869, that Stone had built over 10 miles of Howe bridges, the beginning of Massa Stone's fortune. The Howe Trust Bridge was really the dominant form for railroad bridges for over 30 years until all iron or all steel bridges were built. The speed and efficiency with which Howe Trust bridges could be built shaped two significant historical events in the United States. The completion, of course, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 and the United States Civil War. Railroads played a decisive role in the Civil War. Control of railroads and specifically their bridges were important objectives of both the Union and the Confederacy. Certainly one of the contested bridges was the one in Nashville over the Cumberland River. It is a how truss, a classic how truss. Note the armor. Note the guarded gates and note the sniper turrets, clearly a point in which the North and the South fought over control of this bridge. A very similar bridge was also built in Fort Snelling, Minnesota. It had a swing span in the middle 
which also used a Howe truss and was completed in 1867. But Howe bridges were built throughout the nation and for both railroads and road bridges. This is an example of two uh, Howe bridges, one for a railroad on the right and one for a road on the left. You notice that the Howe bridge form was simplified by uh, framing the diagonals only over one panel rather than two panels. This was a modification that occurred roughly in 1845. This also shows a, a Canadian Pacific Railroad bridge over the Nahatlech or Salmon River Bridge, which was built in 1884. The total number of how trusses bridges built in the United States is unknown, but because of the relentless increase in railroad trackage and railroad loads, certainly tens of thousands, up to a hundred thousands of these bridges were built well into the 19th century. The Howe Trust not only affected U.S. bridge design, but it influenced practice internationally. Three important vectors for diffusion of Howe Trust technology internationally were two books and George Washington Whistler himself. Whistler showed and explained the Connecticut River Bridge to British publisher John Wheel, who promptly pro included drawings of the bridge in his 1843 book. The Austrian engineer Carl Gega visited the U.S. to examine its infrastructure and saw the Connecticut River Bridge. He published a very influential book on American wooden bridges in 1845, explicitly focusing on the design of Howe trusses. But certainly the most important vector for transferring Howe truss technology was Whistler himself. In the 1830s, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia wanted to build a railway form from St. Petersburg to Moscow and therefore needed an experienced railroad engineer. In 1839, he sent two prominent Russian engineers, Pavel Malnikov and Nicholas Kraft, to the United States to study railroads. They met with Whistler. In their report to the Tsar, they strongly recommended hiring Whistler as a consulting engineer for the railroad. In fact, Whistler accepted the Tsar's offer. He resigned from the Western Railroad in 1842, and he traveled to Russia, reaching Russia in June 1842. Whistler worked on the Nikolaev Railroad from 1842 until his death in 1849. One of his contributions is that he convinced the Tsar and his engineers to adopt the Howe Truss for their main bridges. Approximately 64 Howe bridges were built for the Nikolaev Railroad. The first one was this bridge built over the Avodny Canal, which uh, spans from the River Neva to the Gulf of Finland, bypassing the delta of the Neva. It was built in 1846, almost, first, almost certainly the first Howe bridge in the European continent. You notice that the diagonal span only one panel, a simplification that had quickly been adopted in the United States. In collaboration with Russian imperial engineers, a series of spectacular bridges were built for the railroad. This is one. This is the famous Moshta River Bridge that was built with Krutikov. It was a deck bridge. It was much larger than the Connecticut River Bridge. It had two tracks, and the deck was completely covered with iron sheets. This is the second spectacular bridge at the valley of the Verebya stream. This is the Verebya Bridge. It was designed by Dmitry Juraski with Whistler. Again, it had two tracks. It was a deck bridge, and it was on a slight vertical grade. In 1851, Tsar Nicholas and his family traveled from St. Petersburg to Moscow. The Tsar stopped the train at the valley went, walked into the valley, and viewed the Great Bridge. The completion of the Nikolai Railway was considered one of Tsar Nicholas's greatest accomplishments. It is commemorated on the Equestrian Monument to Tsar Nicholas I in St. Isaac's Square in St. Petersburg. One of the high reliefs shows the Tsar at Verebya. The bridge in the background is a direct descendant of the Connecticut River Bridge. 
It's a direct descendant of Claude Navier, Stephen Harriman Long, George Washington Whistler, William Howe, and Amasa Stone. Howe bridges were not only built in Russia, but throughout Europe. In 1866, three prominent French engineers published a book specifically for railway engineers. The book contains many images of Howe Railway Bridge. Here are two. One is called the Bezigain Bridge, and the other one is called the Bandon Bridge. They are in a book by Perdonnet, Ponceau, and Flachat called A New uh, Portfolio for Engineers of Railways. Another bridge that is illustrated is the Wallenhofer Bach Bridge, which is also clearly a descendant of the Connecticut River Bridge. This is another example. It's called a, this is called the King Ludwig Bridge, built in 1847 and to 1851 in the German city of Kempton. Again, it's clearly a descendant of the Connecticut River Bridge. Here's the bridge today. It's the finest extant example of the earliest Howe Trust technology first used for the Connecticut River Bridge. It was honored in 2012 as a civil engineering landmark by the Federal Chamber of Engineers of the Republic of Germany. Modern Howe bridges are still being built now in Bavaria as well as in Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Another example, this one from Norway, is the Goldfossen Bridge, built in 1864. The note that this bridge did not have any braces from the piers to the bottom cord, and also it did not have any siding. The reason is that they chose to protect the bridge by extending the roof a large distance beyond the plane of the trusses. It extended roughly two meters or six feet from the planes of the trusses. The Howe Truss and the Connecticut River Bridge not only profoundly changed bridge construction, but also building construction. Railroads require new building forms such as stations and locomotive, and locomotive roundhouses. The Howe Truss was adapted for these uses, especially to affect very long clear span roofs. In fact, the Springfield Roundhouse uh, used Howe trusses for the roof, as indicated in this drawing from Guild. And there was a locomotive roundhouse built on Van Rensselaer Island, just opposite uh, Albany, uh, to house Boston and Albany trains. Uh, it's very difficult to see, but you have to look at the round oval. And that round oval is a trust arch or a trust rib that in fact is uh, made up of, that is in fact a how truss. This is more easily see, uh, understandable in the extant uh, President Street Station in Baltimore. This was a tied arch design built in 1850, and this is the drawing again from the historic American engineering record. Note the how truss arch rib. You can see that in the picture below the drawing. That, this is still extant, and it is a measure of the influence of the Howe Truss in building construction. Another example is a similar trust arch, this one in Frankfurt, Germany. How, wood Howe Trusses continued to be used after iron and steel had become common, when wood was the most economical material choice. I'll just give you two more examples. Uh, this is a picture of the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago for which most of the buildings were meant to be temporary. If you take your eyes off the woolly mammoth and the giant octopus, you'll see on the left in the, uh, in the square bounded by a red rectangle, uh, you will see that how trusses are in fact supporting this roof. And the last example is uh, something close to my heart, early in the 20th century, in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. This was the Cleveland, Ohio Elysium, built in 1907, at one time the largest indoor skating rink. If you note that the arches forming the roof of the Cleveland Elysium are in fact Howe trusses, a direct descendant of a mass of stones bridge 
in, over the Connecticut River for the Western Railroad. In summary, the Connecticut River Bridge was one of the most important bridges built in the United States in the 19th century because it was the prototype for the dominant form for U.S. railroad bridges for over 30 years until all iron or all steel bridges were built. It enabled the extraordinarily rapid expansion of U.S. railroads. It introduced the large-scale use of wrought iron in bridge construction. Its simple details enabled industrialization of bridge fabrication. The Howe Trust transformed long-span building roof and floor systems. And the Howe form disseminated rapidly and was widely used internationally. Thank you very much.